you know, today um, we're talking with our friend Brandon Reyes here from Trueball. Brandon, you joined us, uh, I don't know, it was a while ago for a couple podcasts. We really appreciated that. But, um, you know, the thing I find fascinating is you don't really live out in the East Coast, but it is East for us. Sure. And um, a state that I've always been fascinated with that I haven't hunted is Virginia. Um, and I know you have some experience with that. And I know the state is probably like any other state. There's good areas, there's bad areas, there's populated areas, or there's a lot of hunters in some areas. What uh, what is the whitetail situation where you're at in Virginia? How hard is it to find a place to hunt? And what is the, the bow hunting uh, prospects there? Um, I think it's a lot. Like first, thanks for having me on again. I enjoy Absolutely. doing this. But uh, uh, getting to Virginia, it's 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 become one of the better states. Uh in the country to hunt uh but like you mentioned it's a lot like uh, ian. uh everything else i'm sorry I'm yeah. ian hand me an almanac i'm sorry you're gonna keep going hand me an almanac please it's like everywhere else but I, i'm sorry continue because yeah, i'm gonna no look problem. this up while you're talking <laughs> you keep telling me about it how yep. long have you been hunting there well I'm, I'm i've been there since 2007 okay and uh you know i say that it's you know becoming better and you know one of the better states to hunt uh, you know, it could be seen as some as crazy, but uh, I don't. Since I don't think I've so. been there, it's it's definitely improved a lot. So I'm going to tell you right now to um, to assure you, mm-hmm. Virginia is up there. Virginia, you're looking at a a state with a pretty stable deer population, an, an average harvest about two hundred thousand uh, bow hunters. Actually, the bow hunter population is pretty low, 75,000. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of gun hunters. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Is it small properties, big properties? Uh, um, well, we have a lot of national forests. You do? Yep. Okay. And a lot of people, uh, I mean, there's there's some diehards that really go deep in the national forest. But there's the, the majority of the population don't touch it. And, you know, you're going to find, you know, good animals in that area. But like everybody else over the last 10, 15 years, They've really bought into the food plots and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, all of that that goes on into, in, you know, growing big deer. And uh, so you see more of that. And I think a lot of that is the reason why we see, you know, multiple deer over 200 every year mm-hmm. taken in, in Virginia. And uh, it's definitely gotten better in the 16 years that I've lived there for sure. Uh, but, you know, it's I still think there's room for improvement. I know, like, currently we can kill three bucks. Oh, you uh, can. Yeah. Can so, you kill them all with your bow if you want? If you want to, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, uh, you can get two, uh, two with a gun uh, if you want. But, uh, yeah, it's. I think until something is addressed there as far as, like, uh, you know, maybe limiting that uh, antler restriction or a, uh, uh, you know, whatever it may be, one buck rule for a certain county and earn a buck, uh, you know, by harvesting a doe. Uh, until stuff like that, I think, takes place, I think it won't, like, take the next step. But uh, there's there's some really good bucks. I uh, was able to harvest in 2017 uh, the first buck that I ever killed in Virginia, and I had lived there since 2007. Wow! So I had passed a lot of animals. I mean, it wasn't from not hunting. It was just you know I was very particular. I grew up in the Midwest. I I kind of knew the age structure that I wanted to harvest, and really wasn't presented that until 2017. I harvested animal, the second biggest whitetail taken with the bow and arrow in the state really so yep. what, what did it score so it was 170 boone and crock wow yep. and uh we have a virginia scoring system as well it you know incorporates a couple other measurements uh and i think uh virginia scoring was 207 so rarely kind of like uh you know the boone and crockett scoring uh it's not very common that you see many even with the virginia scoring uh, over 200 that's a monster so, anywhere yep, yep it was it was a great animal and like i said i haven't come close to touching that since but i'm also pretty picky so uh, uh you know i think you know there's definitely uh you know a lot like m- many other places in the country there's you know a lot of private land but there's a lot of uh areas that you know people don't let any hunting and then there's a lot of areas that's national forest i totally forgot timber. about that um uh, walt hampton who, who used to, uh, he used to be our field editor. He's from Virginia. He has written extensively about mountain hunting in oh, yeah. Virginia, and yep. I know how difficult that is. Very difficult. Um, you know, we are having this discussion on an earlier podcast with Pat uh, Mateen. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know Pat, he's, uh, he's been in the archery industry a long time. 
he lives out in Idaho and he does mountain hunting out there. But if you look at Idaho and Virginia, similar but different. Right. And uh, I think you even find that like in the Ozarks, like in parts of Missouri and things like that. It's just a different topography. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Now I know you switch from there and you also hunt Ohio. Mm-hmm. How is that different? What is it about five hours from you? Yeah, so I can drive to where I hunt in Southern Ohio in about five hours. Uh, and to me, just looking at the animals. So I watch the herd all year long just because of, you know, a dozen trail cameras up there that are on, you know, that send me cell pictures daily. Uh, but it's just amazing to me the the size and quality of animals from literally that short distance away. And, uh, you know, I, I think that's, you know, one of the things that draws me to that area is uh, its reputation. I mean, I think it's much higher than Virginia on the mm-hmm. list as far as uh, much you know, higher. big state, big buck state. Uh, so that's, you know, obviously why I go there. So, uh, and it also helps when you have some target animals that, you know, are, have got your attention. So uh, I make the drive and, and try it out. And uh, I've yet to be successful, but again, it's another uh, uh, state that the season goes a little bit longer. So uh, as long as the bucks haven't shed their antlers, it's, uh, you got to, couple extra weeks to hunt so so you know uh, well you don't know me that well but uh i have to look up the stats oh now if you would if you would ask me to um analyze those two states just off the numbers Mm -hmm. um this is going to surprise you um just off the the pure numbers now guys you got to understand I love trophy deer. I've killed trophy deer. I'm not a trophy deer guy. I'm not. I'm, I'm a deer hunter. Yep. And I do it with there. I do it with a crossbow. I do it with a bow. I do muzzleloader, rifle, you name it. Mm-hmm. But if you look at Virginia, we said about approximately 200,000 uh, deer being killed totally. So only 75,000 bow hunters. Yep. Ohio, guess what? Approximately 200,000 deer being killed annually. Mm-hmm. 205,000 bow hunters. Wow. So yep. Ohio has... Three times the number of bow hunters. Uh, the harvest isn't there, but it's a different cat in the fact that I'd say for the most part, um, from the quality aspect, mm-hmm. it's a different situation. Now, describe that property for me. Uh, your Ohio property is it a large piece, small piece? No, it's only about a hundred acres. Um, you know, it's got about uh, I don't know about. A fifth of that is tillable, mm-hmm. so it's uh, you so know, you got planted. some area you can put some food. Yep, it's planted, mm-hmm. and then in addition to that, I have about five or six food plots that that are planted separately aside of the, the crop field. So um, it's, a little bit a different situation. Yep. Yeah, so it's it's rolling. It's not flat because uh, it's in the southern part of the state, uh, but it's you know basically small pockets. Uh, I've always liked you know the smaller pockets as opposed to the big, huge you know tracks of timber or whatever. Uh, just for pinch points and uh, you know different areas where you can catch a buck cruising as opposed to just hoping he walks by through the middle of the woods you know so uh, that's kind of my my setup there so I, I do a lot of you know hunting the edges uh, hunting pinch points where different you know funnels come together creeks and, and all that good stuff that's pretty cool so you you get uh, you get the nice gamut of the different types of hunting yep. I get to experience that just through my travels which is nice. Um, And at home, too. Very small properties, different types of hunting. Deer Talk Now is brought to you by Mossberg. Mossberg has been supplying American hunters with quality firearms for over 100 years. Over the years, they've upheld their commitment to innovation by creating a handful of firearms that have shaped the way we hunt today. For more information, visit Mossberg.com. Before we get off on the hunting topic, we're going to stay on the hunting topic, but the, we're going to get a little bit more into some uh, technology and, and s- some of your opinions. But um, I know you went elk hunting this past year. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, tell us about that because I know you got one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was a great. Uh, it ended up great. Uh, it started kind of rough, and, you know, it's, you never know what you're going to get, you know, when you, you plan a you know, specific week. It could be a bad week. It just could be weather bad, you know, whatever. Uh, but uh, I had uh, originally planned on going to Iowa deer hunting this year, uh, and I had uh, what I thought was enough points to draw the tag. Well, I didn't draw. Which state was it? Iowa. For oh, for deer. For deer. Okay, yeah, yep, yeah, for deer. Okay. So uh, with without drawing Iowa, I was like like scrambling to find something to hunt, you know, because I was starting to get the bug and ready to get out. So uh, 
because normally I would make three trips or so to uh, to Iowa throughout the season of the deer season just because I wanted because I don't get the tag but every five years or more I wanted to be able to to fill that tag uh, so when I didn't draw that I was looking into you know other aspects and uh, I was able to purchase a landowner tag in New Mexico. Okay. I didn't draw the regular draw for New Mexico, so uh, I kind of already had my foot in, you know, with an outfitter, and I just wanted to, to go, so I needed to get a tag. So I purchased a landowner tag, and it was in an area that I haven't hunted before. Uh, I normally hunted uh, the timber around the Gila National Forest the previous two or three other times that I went, and uh, this was going to be in a different area in Unit 10. It's kind of northwest you know, part of the state, not far from uh, Arizona line. Mm -hmm. And so we started running and gunning the first few days. And I think five days into the hunt, uh, the animals were kind of whining, you know, they weren't very vocal at all. And uh, we were just basically looking for a needle in a haystack. And uh, so, you know, I was like, you know, we're going to have to change it up. You know, something's going to have to change. And uh, so we continued to run and gun in the mornings, but in the afternoons, I uh, was able to set on a water tank. And uh, it had been dry pretty much since spring. They had a real good spring as far as being, you know, wet, which was great for antler growth. Uh, but it had dried up, and you know, it was real, you know, it was hard getting anywhere without being noisy and uh, just very, very little rain. And uh, so I knew the animals would be coming to water. I mean, even deer hunting. I mean, my best advice would be to have, you know, a good source of fresh water. It's always, you know, even in the rut. They may not come to, to food, but they're always going to look for wasps. Especially if it's hot. Yep. Yep. <clears throat> and uh, so I set up on a water hole. I had four days left of my hunt, uh, and it was September 21st was the first day. I actually sat in a tree stand, and I've never hunted elk out of a tree stand before. Wow, that's cool. Yep. So it was it was kind of like in my comfort zone because I am a deer hunter. And uh, so it was real similar to, you know, deer hunting other than, you know, normally I don't set on a water hole for deer, but in some cases you do. But, uh, yeah, so the first day I sat there and nothing happened and uh, no bu no bugles, you know, I didn't hear anything. Uh, so I was like, okay, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to commit to it, you know, because I always, even deer hunting, I don't like not going to the same place, you know. I at least try to go there three times, uh, three sits, you know. And, uh, you know, I never know what kind of routine the deer's on. And, you know, eventually, especially if you got trail camera, you know, pictures and stuff like that uh you know they don't come every day so um i had committed i was going to hunt the next four evenings in that stand so that's what i planned on doing in the second evening i just you know temperatures were cooling off and everything was right and I just happened to look up and the bull had already you know had already came into the area that i was at without me knowing him uh being there and uh by the time i actually physically saw him the first time uh to I saw him laying about 60 yards away. It was probably less than a minute. Oh, my gosh. Yep. It happened that fast. That fast, yep. So, yeah, I saw him. Uh, I was actually sitting because uh, I had uh, some intel from the area that, the you know, the animals were moving, you know. At this time, it was before the time changed, so it was about 7 p.m. And uh, so this all happened at around 6. So I was it was a little bit ahead of time, plenty of daylight. And uh, I was just it just caught me, caught me off guard. And. Yeah, I looked to my left and I saw him there and uh, kind of was trotting in and I had a trail camera on uh, the water hole. So uh, I got two pictures of him going down into the water hole uh, before I shot him. And, you know, he gave me all the time in the world to range him. 44 yard shot, which, you know, I was very comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Made the shot. And I don't tell many people this, but at full draw, I actually, you know, uh, had to stop. You know, I kind of closed my eyes and rebooted because... I know my best shot is going to be about four to five seconds. Uh, by the time I come to full draw and 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 anchor and put my pin and let it settle and squeeze, my best shots, you know, anywhere, you know, from four to five seconds generally. And uh, I had overheld, so I was like, you know what, I need to reboot, you know. Wow. And I'm doing this at full draw while the bull's standing there. And uh, I did that. Ten seconds later, made the shot. Perfect shot. Uh, Perfect double lung, top of the heart shot, hit the opposite shoulder because uh, he was slightly quartered away, which is perfect. And, uh, you know, Bull did everything he could to get out of the water hole, but, you know, he probably, I think he expired about 30 yards from where the shot was. So you uh, made a great shot. Yeah, it was, everything was perfect. And what was your, what's your setup? Uh, bow, broadhead, arrow? 
So I use uh, I use the mechanical two inch uh, titanium sever broadhead. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's a uh, it's a rubber band held yep. uh, broadhead. I use an Easton 400 uh, long range uh, axis arrow, mm-hmm. and uh, so I use the insert the uh, half out that goes in that arrow. Uh, and altogether, I'm looking about for. I like to stay around the 410 to 420. Oh, okay. Yep. Uh, as far as uh, total arrow weight, and I shoot about 70, 71 pounds. So, at the time, I was shooting the Matthews. Uh, uh, it was before my lift came in, so I was, oh, I was the, shooting the, the phase four. Phase four. Yep. yep. But it was about 292 feet a second. So, uh, it's good because it keeps your sight tape small, gives you less margin for error. Uh, build some forgiveness into your setup. So now, uh, are you shooting uh, back tension releases? Um, for hunting, I generally, or for everything generally, I use a thumb activator. You do? Yep. Okay. Yep. So uh, it's just, I think, I think to keep it simple. So I use that all summer, and and compete with that year round. So I don't think it's wise for me to change that up. So I use the same one that I do for hunting it, that I use all season during target season. So. What you guys gotta, gotta understand is, if you haven't already looked it up, he has his tournament shooter, he's a really good, really good archer. And he works for an archery company, True Ball. Yep. Been around for a very long time. Yep. Uh, makers of releases. And I actually just saw uh, this year, uh, and just recently, um, I don't want to date this podcast, but it was <laughs> today or yesterday, you guys were named best new release for 2024. Yep. Um, tell tell the listeners what is that release. And we're going to, for the guys who, and gals who are watching this podcast, we'll show you some photos. And we're also going to give you some links. But what's the name of it? And uh, just maybe describe it for okay. the listeners. Yeah, so mm. uh, we come out with the Ultimate Flex this year. That's a new thumb-activated uh, trigger release. Uh, and... Previously, we've made models uh, with adjustable head length, so uh, nobody's ever done it with a thumb-activated model. So uh, our designers and engineers went to work, and we designed it. And so now we have a thumb-activated release that has the ability to slide the head forward and back to minutely or micro-adjust the length of the head. And what this does is it allows the archer to fine-tune their draw length without uh, you know, cutting a D-loop, and tying on a new one, shorter, longer, whatever you may need wow, to get that's your interesting. Okay. jaw length to fit right. <clears throat> or you don't have to change any uh, settings on the bow itself, either cams or modules. So uh, we built this quarter inch, it's approximately quarter inch, uh, that, and, and an eighth inch, as we all know, makes a big difference mm-hmm. in, in the way you know, draw length feels. Mm-hmm. So uh, a quarter inch is a huge amount of adjustment uh, when it comes to that aspect. So uh, having that ability just to you know move that a little bit, you know, either direction is a big plus for target archers and when they're trying to get that exact fill and uh, be able to repeat the same shot over and over again. So that's the ultimate flex. It still has a lot of our other cool uh, features that we've uh, designed and put on other releases like the uh, flex finger pieces. So you can make the release a three finger or a four finger model without having to buy a whole separate release. You just got to get the the finger pieces. Uh, It's got an adjustable uh, tri, uh, three axis uh, trigger so it telescopes in and out it spins in and out to where you can you can twist the thumb barrel to where you know it fits you best and then this year we also knew for this year we added scallops to the side of the handles that fits the hand perfectly uh, as far as uh, it's being er- more ergonomic mm-hmm. so as your fingers mm-hmm. taper down in size or length uh, you know across the from your top uh, your index finger down to your pinky We've made that feel fit the, that uh, those finger beds a lot better by putting the scallops on the edge of the release. So I was looking at the release before, and I actually noticed that, but I didn't even think that would like, oh, this is a new design. Yep. Um, so that's pretty cool. I mean, when you look at everything you just said, if you're an archer, and it, I've I've been plagued with it out throughout my career because I'm shooting a brand new boat every single year. Sure. And you want to adjust. For me, it's a pain. Yeah. Because it's like, like you said, if you have to cut out a D-loop or if you have to have that bow, go to the, um, for me, it's a pro shop because yeah. Brad can do his own, I can't. Yep. Um, I just, I'm not mechanically inclined. <laughs> and um, th- it's a it's a hassle. Yeah. And now you can basically adjust that right from your release, yep. which s- saves time and makes it a lot more user friendly. Absolutely. And I think those <clears throat> technologies is what, uh, you know, brought it to, you know, I think the, the, the people that chose the awards here uh, in picking our release as the best release, uh, you know, they're uh, not only 
uh, staff, but they're people that are in the shops and uh, they're part of. The, well, I know that uh, those guys. Are, I mean, it's a family-run business. It's a uh, basically people who live and breathe archery, which is very cool. Which brings me to my next uh, subject for you. Um, True Ball's been around forever. It's been. I met Ben. I think it was my first year here. Mm-hmm. It was like 30 years ago, just almost, yep. quite. And uh, we hunted together. Um, things have changed, obviously, since 1994, five, mm-hmm. um, even before that. We've seen archery undergo huge changes. Um, we increased technology, obviously, but also the influx of crossbows into our seasons. Sure. Um, just and, and we already talked about that probably till we're blue in the face. I don't want to talk about crossbows. What I want to talk about is archery and what I should say is bow hunting in general. Mm -hmm. And when I say bow hunting, um, I talk on both sides of my mouth because I do do consider crossbows bow hunting. I know you probably don't. Other people don't. (laughs) But as far as just bow hunting with a compound bow, um, what's your crystal ball? Uh, Where where do you see things now? And uh, where do you see things going with bow hunting? Yeah, it's, it's hard to predict because there's, you know, there's hills and valleys and uh you know i know that uh certain things dictate you know different aspects of archery uh i'm all for archery no matter how you sling your arrow uh but uh you know there are some stipulations i know there were some issues with the uh, air bow and stuff uh you know a few years mm-hmm. ago but uh you know as as long as it's uh you know supporting our industry and buying those hunting and fishing licenses and stuff like that you know i'm i'm all for it but uh you know, as I was alluding to, um, we've seen different different things uh, in our uh, society that affect archery, you know, differently. And I remember a few years back, uh, you know, there was several movies uh, that hit the big screen that had different aspects of archery within them, and that really, you know, started a whirlwind or a storm of people, you know getting interested in target archery hunger games was one of them wasn't yes. it yeah yeah and i'm i'm not sure the year but i i thought it was maybe around 2008 or something but uh which was a tough economy year so uh you know that is always uh you know certain things like that dictates you know things as well as far as uh uh sales and stuff like that which you know we saw quite a bit of uh influx in in tournament archery because there was a lot of interest based off of those movies I know one thing that, uh, uh, as a manufacturer, we were really, really looking forward to uh, announcements that were made earlier this summer, that there was a potential for compound bows to be included in the Olympic Games in 2028 in LA. Uh, Unfortunately, the uh, International Olympic Committee and all those folks decided against that. Oh no. But we were, you know, trying to gear up for what could be uh, you know, another one of those Hunger Games type of situation. Well, oh, that would have been huge. But tenfold. Yeah. Because there you're, you know, you know, we're in a business of primarily catering to target archery and having, you know, hunting as well based off of our target archery designs. But uh, there's a lot of companies that um, are completely, you know, basically geared towards hunting only with very little target archery influence. So we were really, really looking forward to having, you know, the Olympics uh, with compounds being a part of it and what it was going to do to our business. And uh, so we were, you know, kind of, you know, anticipating, you know, we had heard some intel that, you know, there was a possibility it was going to happen. And then when it didn't happen, it was kind of very disappointing. And uh, so we had to change our, you know, our outlook on things regarding that. There, I think there is another potential of that happening in the future again, another vote or something. But currently, you know, it's not going to happen in 2028. So, uh, you know, that's a big guiding influence on, you know, uh, as a manufacturer. Um, and I think, you know, as far as hunting is concerned, uh, you know, we primarily, I mean, we've looked at different ways we can make, you know, if, there's, if there was things that we could make that would fit into the crossbow line of stuff. But there's never been anything that, you know, has kind of fit our line, you know, that we could provide to uh, the consumer. So we've always been strictly compound and recurve archery uh, based company. So it's, uh, it's you know, like I said in the beginning, it's there's hills and valleys. And mm-hmm. you kind of got to, you know, ride those out and, you know, be a strong enough company with good technology, good design uh, and 
one of the things we've done over the years is we have decided that no matter what the situation or what the year brings us previously, we have to design products every year to keep people coming back to our brand and to keep our brand relevant. So in doing so, one of those items is, you know, the item we released here at the show and, uh, you know, that we try to release annually. And then even with that, we also try to do stuff in the summer to kind of, you know, bring a little bit more excitement in the middle of the year. So, um, you know, those are kind of things that we, we've we done or we've looked at or that have influenced business decisions for us over the years. Have you have you seen a change in the percentage uh, for just for your business for uh, bow hunting versus art uh, uh, competition archery? Um, I've actually seen. Uh, it seems to me like the number of bow hunters seems to go down a little bit. Uh, you know, I think the ones that are there are pretty serious. But uh, you know, there to me, it, it seems like there's more people that are are kind of going towards the target side, even if they're not. Um, uh, you know, going toward the target side, they're buying more target equipment mm-hmm. to bow hunt with. Uh, I think people are are not uh, or are more inclined to buying the best they can as opposed to uh, what previously has you know just worked. So uh, we're seeing more more guys shoot because they want to be better. More guys are shooting handheld releases uh, over wrist straps because uh, they want to take it to the next step. You know, they want to go to the next level. They want to be better. They want to you know be able to. Uh, perform when you know they're called to perform when that split second uh, like we were just talking about Mm -hmm. my elk situation you know it that you know can happen at any moment so um, and not only with releases you see the same thing with sights and uh, you know other accessories as well but uh, yeah I think um, you know even if you know the you know the target archery and bow hunters are status quo you know and the numbers haven't changed much. I think you do see that shift of more target quality products being sold, and that's where I may be misguided a little bit because more of those people are buying our target stuff. It's not necessarily target shooters, but it's people buying target stuff to buy. It's a good. It's some good points that you make there that I never really thought about, but it makes total sense because you can extrapolate that out across. The entire category with arrows and broadheads and mm-hmm. um, not to say that there was junk companies around before but the the bow hunters I see today are uh, for the most part really serious oh, yeah. I mean bow hunting let's face it bow hunting has always been an expensive sport I don't right. care when you started mm-hmm. you got to buy this you got to buy that there's products that you're gonna buy like yeah you're always gonna go through arrows but you you bow hunt for 20 years, you're going to go through a couple sites, a couple rests, a mm-hmm. couple releases. Um, and then after a while, you're like, no, I want the good stuff. But even the people who are starting, mm-hmm. I find are even more serious now. Right. Um, I don't know if it's an, uh, the, the adult onset hunter mentality or whatever it happens to be. Or maybe it's just our culture um, because there is more expendable income that they do want uh, the higher quality products, which I think is interesting. Um, the other question I had for you, Brandon, was um, on that thumb release, that's not a tension release then. Correct. It's just a thumb. Thumb like, activated, yep. Thumb activated, yep. Yep. which is interesting because now I have to try one because yeah. I, <laughs> the only thumb style release I ever tried was a, a tension release. I'm like, I could not get the hang of that. Yep. Um, actually, Ben sent it to me like 20 years ago, mm-hmm. and I'm like, I, I can't figure this out. Um, yep. I, but I know that's a, that's a different thing. Yep. But we're going to have to save some topics. I wanted to uh, keep this one shorter today because sure. of our environment. Um, we appreciate everybody listening. Brandon, um, True Ball, where, uh, it, now I know you have dealers, mm-hmm. but also people want to find out more information or just find out what the new products are, where can they find them? We have social media sites, you know, everyone you can, you can have. We have Instagram, Facebook. Uh, Twitter, X, whatever you want to call it. We have them all. True Ball uh, Archery. And then XL, yep. is it under the same? Uh, XL Archery. Yep. Is it under the same? Yep. Yeah, right. You can okay. find one with the other. <clears throat> okay. uh, they're always paired together. And then uh, we have a True Ball Archery YouTube page as well with a lot of videos. They actually have some great videos on yep. that page. Yep. Ch- check it out. It's uh, I've actually been watching those. Uh, there's a lot of archery know-how. Even if you're not a geeky I always say the geeky gun guys. There's geeky bow guys, as we know. Oh, yeah. But these guys have the info. It's, it's very helpful. Yeah, a lot of technical information there. Well, thank you for joining us yeah. once again. Um, we're going we're gonna to keep having you on as long yeah. as you let, let us have you. Sure. And all we ask you guys, 
th this is it. All we ask you, like and subscribe. That's it. That's all we're asking. And comment, especially if you have questions. Even if it's something that Brandon brought up today, we will relay those questions. We do it to, for all our guests, and they're more than happy to provide those answers because we're here to help you become better shooters, but ultimately better hunters. So for Brandon Reyes, I am Dan Schmidt. Thank you for joining us for Deer Talk Now. Every Thursday, brand new episodes, everywhere platform, uh, every platform where podcasts are dropped, and also the video versions. Check them out. You, our YouTube page is YouTube backslash DDH online, and then also Facebook and Instagram. So until next Thursday when we're going to bring you another episode, we'll catch you again for Deer Talk Now.